So around this time last year, I started building one of my favourite projects that I've ever made, and it's this electric foundry. This is definitely one of my favourite projects because it's been so useful, not just for casting aluminium, but basically for heating anything up. One of the reasons that I love this project so much is the fact that it gives me the ability to just melt metal and cast it into any shape that I want, whenever I want, just in my garage, and I can do it safely and cleanly, and it's just so useful. So since using this foundry, I've used it to cast hundreds of things, and there'll be a link in the description to my metal casting playlist where you can see a few of those things that I've been doing metal casting for. Most of the metal casting I've been doing off camera for my art project. I've also been using it for heat treating knives and generally just heating up anything that I need and it's been really good and an incredibly useful tool. So in this video I'm going to be doing some maintenance, some repairs and some upgrades to the electric foundry to make it better. So the main upgrades that I'm doing today are adding some new coils inside the kiln which will increase the maximum temperature and I'm also making a bigger crucible so it can melt a much larger volume of metal. If you haven't already seen the original tutorials on how to make this foundry you should probably check them out, links in the description down below. In the original electric foundry, I was using some 0.8mm thick nichrome coils that I got off eBay. They were literally about £2 and all you have to do to find them is search on eBay kiln heating elements or something like that and you get hundreds of them that come up and they're all the same pretty much. So the nichrome worked really well and it was very powerful and heated up very quickly, but the problem was it wasn't very resistant to oxidising or corrosion. So over time the wires began to oxidise and become very brittle, become thinner and thinner. As the wires became thinner, the resistance of the coil increased. That meant less current flowed and there was less power in the foundry, so it would take even longer to heat up. And then eventually one of the coils burned all the way through and the foundry stopped working entirely. So I need to replace the coils. So I could very easily just replace these coils with the nichrome coils again, and it's not much to ask to replace them once a year, they're very cheap and it's not very difficult to do. However, 900 degrees Celsius is probably around the maximum working temperature of nichrome in my opinion, especially when it's this thin, so I'd like to be able to get some higher temperatures. So for that I'm going to be using a different alloy of coil, which is called carathnol. This is slightly more difficult to find, and it's an alloy of heating element which is used in some higher temperature ceramic kilns. However, if you just search carathnol heating element on eBay, occasionally you find some good results, and that's what I did. And it can go up to about 1100 degrees Celsius, and it's much more corrosion resistant than just nichrome. So it means that hopefully the coils will last a bit longer. I'm also going to be using some thicker coils this time. These are going to be 1.2 millimeters thick. So as I was disassembling my foundry to get at the coils and then replace them, I realised that the entire bottom of the foundry had began to crack since the alumina silicate fire bricks that I originally used that I'd cut in half weren't strong enough to support the weight of the crucible and the stuff melting on it. So this definitely needed to be replaced as it was a gap in the insulation and it was getting weak anyway. So I made the lid out of a combination of plaster of Paris and sand, a 50-50 mix, and that's held up pretty well, so I'm going to be doing the same thing for the base, and that's going to be reinforced with some more angle steel. The first step was to start to cut some of the angle iron to make the base. I'm going to do it in the same hexagon pattern that I did with the actual frame of the metal, but it's going to be slightly smaler. So I just cut pieces of the angle iron off and then mitered them at 45 degrees on my cold cut chop saw. This is much more accurate than putting on the 45 degree angle with my angle grinder, but you can still do it with the angle grinder as I showed when I made the original frame for the electric foundry. I then just welded everything together and made sure to keep it nice and square. Lots of welding and grinding later, then I was ready to give it a quick coat of heat resistant spray paint, and then it was done. This is how that piece will look once it's on the bottom of the foundry, and at the moment it's open so I want to completely enclose it. And for that I'm just going to be using the steel from an old baking tray, as I did with the lid again, since it's already heat resistant and already spray painted black to fit in with the colour scheme. I then cut and welt the baking tray onto the bottom of the frame so that it was solid and pretty much watertight. I 
I then wanted to see what bits of aluminosilicate fibric I had left over that would fit inside. I knew they wouldn't fit in just normally so I cut them up and sort of slid them in like jigsaw pieces. But that still wasn't strong enough for what I wanted and the last one sort of fell apart even though it was made from the fire bricks so I want to try and reinforce this one with a bit of plaster of Paris. I'm going to try and use the plaster of Paris as sort of refractory mortar and put it in between the bricks and hopefully it'll harden and lock them all together. So I put a layer of it on the bottom, put the bricks in and then started putting it on over the top as well and then left that overnight to harden and this is what it looks like once it's done. This is what it looked like in the morning and it was completely solid and I was pretty sure that it was going to hold together. However, it wasn't completely flat and that was kind of annoying because it meant that it didn't seal on the bottom of the foundry correctly. So I decided to use my CNC machine with an old wood cutting carbide bit in and this bit was going to get ruined when I used it to level the surface but I didn't really mind since it was a really old bit and I had my dust extractor extracting all of the nasty dust which comes from this. Once it was done the piece was completely flat and smooth and sealed very well on the bottom of the foundry. I could then attach on the new coil exactly as I did with the original nichrome coil. One thing that I did differently this time was instead of using the screw thread terminals that I used last time on the bottom, I'm going to replace them with some ceramic terminal blocks which are pretty cheap and you can find them on eBay really easily and they're made to go inside kilns and they can withstand much higher temperatures. These blocks are normally made for a live and a neutral wire, so I just smashed off one of the sides to make it a little bit smaller. It was pretty easy to chip off. One of the issues that I had quite a lot on the first iteration of the electric foundry was as the coils heated up, they expanded and liked to move about slightly, and this meant that sometimes they fell out of the grooves which they were in on the side of the foundry. So I decided this time that I'd take some of the leftover A2 coil and stretch it out and bend it over into staples. I could use those staples to press around the coil into the soft fire brick and hold them in place forever so they can't fall out, and these are relatively easy to remove if I ever need to replace the coil again. Another thing that I did was some of the bricks were starting to fall apart and they'd cracked in the middle and this would be fine, there's not much gap in them and it was still all held together by the metal frame but I decided to use some high temperature mortar to glue all of the bricks together. I again got this off Amazon and it's pretty cheap, it cost me about £5 for this entire tub that will last forever pretty much. So that's most of the upgrades to the bottom of the foundry, now I'm going to do a couple of upgrades to the lid of the foundry, since over time it'd start to wear out and break down. So here you can see the underside of the plaster of Paris had started to crack over time with the rapid heating and cooling, and then some of that sometimes occasionally fell into the foundry, got in the metal and it was really annoying to clean out. So I decided that I'm going to replace this top bit of the lid with some stainless steel sheet, and this is maybe not the most efficient for the insulation, but it will reflect a lot of the radiation and it will just heat up with the foundry and it will be much more solid than the plaster of Paris. I used some more plaster of Paris to repair all of the cracks in the refractory on the top of the lid and then I placed the stainless steel disc around it and drilled some holes all the way through the lid through the metal on the other side. I could then get some M6 threaded rod and jam it up through the holes and then weld it to the stainless steel disc using some stainless steel electrodes. After I drilled out the central hole and tightened everything down, it was then pretty solid. So now I'm going to work on making a new larger crucible for melting larger volumes of aluminium. A while ago when I originally built the foundry I was using a graphite crucible. That oxidised all the way through and broke, spilling aluminium all over the floor. And since then I've used this steel crucible which I welded up from some pipe. I really didn't think that it would last very long since it was just made from steel and I thought the graphite was superior, but I've literally done hundreds of casting wizards with this crucible and it's not even looking like it's going to start to wear out, since when I'm using the electric foundry it doesn't heat it to a temperature where the steel starts to become unstable, since you can control the temperature very accurately. So I'm just going to make another steel crucible, since the last one worked so well. You can see that with this steel crucible here there's loads of room around the edge that I can get much larger volume of aluminium and there's been times when I've filled this crucible all the way up to the top and tried to cast stuff and it's not been big enough. To make this crucible I purchased some larger square steel tubing which has got 4mm wall thickness and it fits almost perfectly inside the electric foundry utilising the maximum volume that it can hold. I traced the cross section onto a plate of 5mm mild steel plate, cut it out with my angle grinder.
I beveled the edges so that the welds would penetrate nice and deeply into the metal, then I started welding it up with my new arc welder. This is a new DC arc welder and it gives me much deeper penetration and much nicer welds, so this should be completely watertight on the first go. And my last arc welder was way louder and way more annoying, it was just one of those transformer buzz box ones. I was originally quite apprehensive about making a crucible out of mild steel, since it's not very corrosion resistant and I think stainless steel would be a better option, however mild steel is much cheaper and much more available for me, it's also easier for me to weld since I have more welding rods for it. And I originally thought that it wasn't going to last very long, however the last crucible has really surprised me with how long it's lasted, and it's not looking like it's going to break anytime soon, so I think this one will be fine. I wouldn't recommend using a mild steel crucible in a charcoal foundry which can get really hot since that could actually melt through the crucible, whereas this foundry can't get above the melting point of steel since the coils that generate the heat themselves are made from steel. Once I'm done I can fill it up with water to cool it down and to check that it's all watertight. It holds the water absolutely fine. The welding isn't great and it's pretty ugly because I'm just getting used to my new welder but it should hold up for this application fine. This crucible is so much bigger than the last one and it's really good because it means that I don't have to cut up much of the scrap before I put it in the crucible, it just fits in without being cut or crushed, which is so much more convenient and easier to melt. One downside to having a crucible this large is it takes so much more energy to heat up. This crucible probably took 4 or 5 times longer than my other crucible to get up to aluminium melting temperatures, which is around 700 degrees celsius to be casting aluminium, and overall it took probably about 2 hours to melt all of the aluminium in this crucible, which still isn't bad considering the power of this foundry. I didn't have a specific project that I wanted to cast the aluminium in, yet I still wanted to see what I could get in the crucible and how heavy it would be and what it would be like to pour it, so I filled up this bin entirely with water. Also another thing that's good about this crucible was it's got such a massive volume that I melted down all of the scrap aluminium that I owned, literally every single piece, and it only filled up the crucible a third of the way. Had I melted down even more all the way up to the top I would have been able to cast something much much larger. This allows me to do much larger projects and think of much larger things to cast. I'm no longer limited by the size of my crucible basically, and that's really nice. So I took my crucible full of molten aluminium and poured it straight into the bin of cold water, just to see what would happen, and this is the result that I pulled out. This actually had the really cool effect of creating a nice water aluminium sculpture, and I've done quite a few of these for my art project already, but I wasn't able to do any this large before, and it was really cool making such a massive one. You might think this is a bit of a waste of aluminium, which is quite a nice metal, and I'll probably remelt this once my art project's over, so it's fine, nothing's wasted. I actually think that some of these sculptures are pretty cool, and here's a few of the other ones that I've done for my art project, they're all a lot smaller. I've also cut some of them in half to get a nice cross section, they've got some really nice cavities inside. Here's also some video that I filmed with my cousin on a very expensive cinematography camera which is worth like over £20,000 just for the lens alone, it's crazy, and this is just some really nice footage that we got of pouring aluminium into water for one of his projects. The next thing I wanted to test was what's the maximum temperature of this foundry, and I'm not going to be able to read this temperature very accurately because the thermocouple on my foundry only goes up to 900 degrees celsius, which was originally fine because this was made for casting aluminium, when I want to cast copper around 1100 degrees celsius it's not hot enough, so the temperature readings won't be accurate. So I started to make this video when there were some of those red hot knife videos going around and it was really annoying me how a lot of them weren't actually 1000 degrees, they were like 500 degrees at most, so I decided to see if I could actually heat a knife up to 1000 degrees. So I took a stainless steel kitchen knife, welded on a handle for it, and then actually put it in my foundry and heated it up to 1000 degrees, and as you can see this is way hotter than most of those videos were. The knife was literally bending and melting under the temperature, and that was probably 1100 degrees celsius, it's kind of hard to tell, but it was way way hotter than most of the other videos of that type. That video actually turned out to be really boring, and the knife cooled down way too quickly to actually do any damage to anything, and I realised that loads of other people were already copying the videos, and that it had become kind of a meme, and that it was not really a good idea to upload that to my channel, so I didn't bother uploading it, and this is the only time I'm going to use this footage at all. Basically a terrible idea, but it did show how hot my foundry could get. So with these new higher temperatures that I can achieve in this electric foundry, I can now mount new metals like copper, 
brass, bronze, gold, silver, all of those are the metals with high melting points. I can pretty much melt all of them in this foundry, which is really great, so I decided to melt down some copper pipes. For this I bought another graphite crucible, my original one ended really badly, it just oxidised all the way through. Again this one's another 100% pure graphite crucible because it was the only one I could get on next day delivery, but I've ordered, also ordered a ceramic crucible and a clay graphite crucible to see which of those works better. So the foundry took about 3 hours to get up to the melting point of copper, which is around 1100 degrees celsius. This may seem like a long time, but if you think about all of the energy involved and the power of the foundry, it's not actually that long. And at this point, the outside of the foundry was also getting pretty hot. I think the hottest point that I registered on the outside of the foundry was 150 degrees Celsius, so you wouldn't want to be touching it. Despite that, the electronics box on the outside of the foundry, since I isolated it with an air gap, wasn't even getting warm. It was literally still 20 degrees Celsius, so there's no risk of the electronics overheating. Once everything was glowing nice and yellow on the inside of the foundry, it was almost painful to look at because it was so bright. I could then add in some of the copper. This copper is just scrap copper pipe that I'd found in my attic. Copper is pretty expensive metal and it's the most sought after scrap metal, so it might be quite hard for you to find scrap copper if you're looking for some. Another good source is electrical cables. The copper actually melted really quickly and once I had a decent amount in the crucible, it was about halfway full, I decided to pour it. This time again I just poured it into some water, I did it in a smaller jug this time since it's a small volume of metal, however I forgot to take into account that the copper was way over double the temperature of the aluminium, it's probably about 1200 degrees celsius, and it was also a plastic jug, which wasn't a good idea, so when I poured it in it actually burned a hole through the side of the jug, and boiled all of the water in the jug, and then was firing out a spray of boiling water, it's kind of like an extreme water gun, it was pretty dangerous. Unfortunately also this doesn't have the same effect as the aluminium with giving some really interesting patterns in the metal, it literally all just sank down to the bottom and was just a flat piece of copper, so I remelted most of it and decided to just cast it into some ingots. So that's pretty much the extent of my copper casting, I did then take one of those ingots and start to machine it into a spinning top or something on my lathe, and I'll be, there'll be more information on that video next week because I'm planning on doing a standalone copper casting video and other metals casting videos, because I also have some scrap brass and some scrap bronze that I can melt down, that'll be pretty interesting as well. And I'll do those once I get my new crucibles, because from this one casting alone, the crucible was probably only up to temperature for around 3 hours or so, just from this one casting alone, the graphite had already oxidised almost all of the way through, which is way too expensive for me to use again. So thanks for watching this video, I really hope that you've enjoyed it, and I really hope that you can also appreciate the amount of effort that I put into making these videos. This video alone has been in progress of being made for over half a year now, and I'm doing it on top of taking my A-levels and other studies that I'm doing as well, trying to get into uni and everything. Taking that into consideration, I'd really appreciate it if you'd help support me on Patreon. Since I post videos so irregularly at the moment, my Patreon only charges per each new upload that I do. So if I don't upload a video in say 5 months or so, you wouldn't be charged at all for any of those 5 months. As well as that, if you do want to get more information on projects in between project videos, then you can also follow my Instagram, the link is in the description down below, and I post much more regular project updates on there, and just things that I'm doing, various other things that I've made. So thanks for watching, I hope that you've enjoyed this video, it will probably be again unfortunately a while until I can get another video out, just because I'm going away for a month or so in the summer holidays, but I have finished all of my exams now, so once I return, hopefully I'll be able to get another video out. I do have a really interesting video and project that coming up that I'm really excited about, and it's making metal pens.